Do you know what we haven't done in weeks? What? Talked recipes. Mm-hmm. But now that you've been pursuing this autoimmune protocol diet, AIP, mm-hmm. for a few weeks I've been accumulating all these recipes to talk about on the show. Mm-hmm. I want to do that today. Food heavy episode. Now, speaking of food, mm. we did get the rabbits that I mentioned last week. Finally. That were coming. Yeah. yeah. So we have four bunnies in our chicken run. Yeah. They're all in one section of the four hutched rabbit cage that we have. There are three does. Yep. And one buck. And you know what a baby rabbit's called? A kit. A kit. A kit. I have learned so much in the last few days. Because <laughs> the way we do it. You want some sheep? Totally. And then we, then we learn about the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew told me he felt like he knew so much and he was really excited and he, he had his first breed because he bred for the spring, right? Litter. <laughs> first litters though, like several of them. Yeah. And he was like, and now I feel like I don't know anything again. <laughs> oh yeah. It was interesting. We live in South Texas and that is a very hot environment. So yeah. when you watch YouTube videos or whatever, read a book about raising rabbits, they do not like the heat. Right. So much so that there's sophisticated cooling systems that you could potentially do. The way we're getting around that is that our friend Andrew over at Edelin Farms, is where we buy some meat, mm-hmm. it's where we buy some vegetables, vegetables from time to eggs. time. Yep. Fantastic local farmer. Yep. Good friend of ours. Yep. I said, "Well, I know the guy. I got a rabbit guy." What I had learned when I started doing research was that there was a breed that had been started in Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Yeah. They're specifically bred for our region. Right. To deal with our heat, to deal with other types of challenges of South Texas, wind, and they're just hardier animals. I like that about us. We went to the guy (laughs) who bred the rabbits for our region's Mm -hmm. house. Dr. Stephen Lukefar. Showed us his operation. Yeah. That's where we bought our rabbits. And I learned a lot that day. Yeah. The first thing I saw was huge piles of rabbit poop underneath the cages that have wire on the bottom so that the poop can fall right through. Andrew was there, coincidentally, to pick up the rabbit manure to take into his compost bin. I'm looking at all that poop and I'm saying, oh yeah, black gold going directly into our chicken run. Mm-hmm. Adjacent to our compost pile... But then Andrew explained that the chickens, you you don't even have to worry about like scooping it up and putting it over there. If it's in your chicken run, they'll just do all the scattering for you. Yeah. And he's right. I've been out there. There's no evidence of rabbit poop. Yeah. That's pretty much the reason why I suggested we put the pen inside the run. They'll take care of it for us. Yeah. And then I have some really good compost that's coming from my rabbits and my chickens and everything in my pen to put in my garden. A whole system. Yeah, exactly. But how old were the rabbits that we purchased? They were born on 12-12, eight weeks old. Yeah, today's the 16th of February. They're not mature yet. They're not like breeding rabbits right. yet. So we learned how to sex rabbits. Yes. And that did. was kind of interesting. Uh-huh. How to hold them. How to hold them correctly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How to spread apart Their areas <laughs> to see male very or female? clearly female, yes. very yeah. clearly male. Yeah. And before, and he did that for us. And here's a boy. Oh, yeah, it sure is. Here's three does. Uh-huh. Yep, that's yeah. right. Uh-huh. Uh, I said, before we leave, can I do that in front of you? Can you be my teacher right now? <laughs> And it is awkward uh, to hold the rabbit correctly. Uh-huh. I know we will get better at it. You have to hold the nape of their neck, but you also have to get their ears because that keeps a little bit more control over them. Right. But and you can't just hold their ears. And if you just hold their nape, then you're not getting as much like calmness and control over them. Right. So in about a week, we'll need to separate our buck from our does. Yep. And then about a month from now, they're ready to start breeding if we choose to. The doctor said... He breeds from about September, when it really starts to cool off in September, until April. Yeah. And, you know, when it, when it starts to warm up in It'll April. It'll be a tad past April when they're of age. One of the things to know about rabbits is they get infertile when the temperatures start to stay above 85 degrees. Right. Male rabbits. Aside the fact that you're trying to just keep them cool and comfortable through the summertime... We won't be ready to breed until the fall. Which, which is, is fine good. with me. Yeah. There's no need here at the dinner table today to overload anyone with any information. We're going to be <laughs> learning as we go. We are. And you're going to learn with us. Exactly. So welcome to the rabbit journey. Welcome to the rabbit journey. Welcome to rabbits. Now, you know that we still have those Dorper Rams Mm -hmm. and no movement has happened on that. It's probably time for us to get that settled so that we can 
start to make movement towards getting the ewes so that we can begin breeding ewes in the fall because I'd like to do that. Breeding rabbits for meat, breeding sheep for meat. Welcome yep. to Freedom Harvest Farms. Yeah. I've noticed that you've begun doing Facebook Lives almost every day now. Yes. Do you always scream in them? Because <laughs> I saw one this past week that was hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, I had already done one that day. It was Monday. And Monday is when I have the open farm, when there's people out here at the farm. And I'm going to be doing lives on Monday, starting the first Monday in March, because we're going to be practicing A Course in Miracles. And I want that to be open to other people online, sure. okay. even if they're not available to come to the farm on that Monday, they can still join us for the live in A Course in Miracles. Now, I've got a special group for that. I was out in the front, and it was a quiet day at the farm that Monday. And so I was out there digging sweet potatoes by myself. I need to get the rest of the sweet potatoes out. It's time to get that done. It's time to get that bed closed back up, planted and ready to go for the spring. Because as soon as we start to get the spring rains and warmth, the sweet potatoes start setting their greens again. And I need to get them in the ground, planted basically. And so I'm out there finishing my sweet potato. And I notice that there's a pretty nice hole in the sweet potato bed. And I'm like, mm-hmm, so there's something either in here or there's something that's been in here. What's the list of things that could have been? Well, what has been in the sweet potato piles in the past has been shrews and toads. And anytime we do a big dig on anything, we come across toads oftentimes. I'm usually always very ho hopeful that we're not like hurting something because when you tr use a tractor to do big digs and stuff oh, like okay. that. And even in the past, over the years of the learning garden, I've literally put a fork through the middle of a toad yeah. as I was digging areas up. This time, I'm, you know, I'm gently trying to get my sweet potatoes out of the ground. I'm not digging around a bunch. You know, I'm just kind of knocking the dirt away. I'm down on my hands and knees, just kind of pulling out one sweet potato at a time. By the way, I've harvested a lot yes, of fantastic have. sweet potatoes this year. I have so many going out to my customers. We've got plenty anymore. It's been a big deal for my AIP diet to have the sweet potatoes available for me to eat. I've got some fantastic recipes about to talk about. And what I see is a brown tail that's clearly a snake because I see the end of it move. I see uh -huh. the tail of the snake move. I could tell it wasn't a rattlesnake because I could see its tail. Right. But I don't know enough about some of the other snakes that we have out here. Um, now, the coral snake is the one that has the red and yellow stripes Kill a on fellow. it. That one. Mm -hmm. That one I would have known as well. I could tell that, that if that one was what it was. One and of it's those not likely... jumped out of a garage door when I was opening it up one time. Jumped <gasps> from the top to the bottom. Yeah. And it slithered away so quickly that I couldn't do the rhyme. I couldn't even like yeah. see to make sure. Kill a well, fellow. If you see something that's red and yellow striped out here, it's a kill a fellow kind. Because okay. that's the kind we have around here. Well, it took off in the garage. Yeah. Um, the thing about those little guys is that they have like a really, really tiny mouth and the likelihood of them being able to strike you or whatever. The well, likelihood of them being able to strike me is probably even more decreased by me screaming like a wild man and running from the garage. <laughs> and then doing that thing where you quickly look around to see, <laughs> Who saw did anybody me? just see that? Like when you fall in public, <laughs> who saw it? Oh, by the, the way, I'm The first thing you do is laugh, you know, yeah. because you're like... <laughs> I meant to do that. <laughs> so I'm kind of keeping an eye on it. I'm still digging. I'm getting the potatoes out. I see it move again. Now I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to deal with whatever this is. The percentile of it being a friendly garden snake of some kind, some kind that I've seen around here, is very high. That's the likelihood. We have four venomous types of snakes in South Texas. Two of them, I'm pretty certain it already isn't. The rattlesnake and the coral snake. Mm -hmm. So that means it's got to be a cottonmouth or I guess it's the moccasin, the water moccasin. Okay. Um, I don't know anything about those other two snakes. I don't know anything about what their skin looks like. I don't know what their tail looks like. I should know those things, but I don't. So I keep digging and I keep trusting that this is just a friendly garden snake and everything's going to be fine. Now I can see it's big because it's big enough to have its whole body wrapped up in a hole and then a whole nother section of it in another part of the bed. Right. And I can tell that it's green and yellow. Okay. This is a garden snake. However, that doesn't change how I feel when I see a snake that close to me in my space, right? In relatively good size. Yeah. And, and, and like looking at me, uh -huh. not like slithering away from me where it's just kind of passing by me and slithering on or, and I've seen this exact, I've probably seen this exact snake in that exact garden because apparently this particular type of snake is very territorial. This is my garden. This is where I live, you okay. know, that kind of thing. 
So I'm sure I've seen this exact snake in that exact garden in other places and it slithered right past me and I've been like, oh, hi, how are you? I'm so glad you're here or, you know, whatever. Then over in one of my other gardens, I have this same type of snake and it likes to climb up the crepe myrtle tree and it has literally been sitting there looking at me in the crepe myrtle tree, but I'm like, hey there, how are you doing? You stay right over there in that tree. Yes, awesome, you know, whatever. But this snake and I are in the same like company. We are hanging out together. It's a green snake. It's probably fine. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. When we were out in the potato bed a couple weeks ago, I had my friend Larry Jo with me and she has her business called um, Internaturalist and she's a naturalist and gardens and learn. she learns a lot about annual gardening from me and has taught me a lot about perennials and naturalists. And so, and so when we were out there one day digging in the potatoes on a Monday, she caught a little brown snake and she picked it up and held it in her hand and let it like, sw- you know, move around. And we had it on video and she talked about it and she told people what it was and all of that. And so I'm like, okay, I can be really brave. I'm going to do a video. I'm going to show people. And I'm, I'm different than her. I, besides the fact that I don't have as much knowledge about snakes as her, but I'm also, you know, kind of funny. I try to be funny and mm. telling people how I actually feel as I'm doing this little video, you know, whatever. And so I go, okay, you hear it? You see, you see, oh, yep. And it's, it's looking at me. Can you see its eyes look right? And then there's another part of its body. Oh, it's really pretty. And then all of a sudden it decides it wants to come out of the hole. And I'm like, so I kind of back up real fast. I'm like, okay, I'm backing up now and it's coming out and it's coming over here toward me. And so now I'm like, okay, I need to get this snake to go out of my sweet potato bed so So that I can finish my sweet potato bed. Like, okay, now friend, it's okay. It's all good. You know, yes, I'm a little nervous and you're nervous and everybody's nervous. So we'll just, you know, you go on about, and that snake turned around and struck at me and I screamed on camera like you've never heard before. Go on over to another part of the garden. (laughs) Okay. That scares me. (laughs) It scared me. Like it actually scared me. That snake was mad. He was like, pissed off that I'd woken him up sure. from his cooled underground slumber in the winter time. Of course, I told it, it's fine. It's, it's 82 degrees tomorrow. You'll be fine. Just go for, you know, whatever. No, it didn't think that was a good idea. I'm over there on the live now at this point, right? And because now I've got it on video, me screaming, <laughs> you know, this is a whole thing. I need to know what this snake is. Everybody get involved in Aislinn and her show going on over here. And so, my mom's over there telling me, just get a stick and like poke it away. So I get this really long, like dead okra stem and I'm like poking at it and it turns back at me and I'm like, oh, okay, you get to, you get the garden today. And yeah. I just walk off. So I've got a section of sweet potatoes that has not been dug up, but I promise you this video, I was scared. <laughs> you don't actually see the snake strike because I jumped and screamed so fast that you kind of miss it. <laughs> oh, it's well narrated. But it's clear what's going on. <laughs> clear emotions and very much your heart racing after the fact. See, this is what I tell you on the weekends when you wake me up in the mornings. Of course I know how that snake feels. <laughs> Ooh. Unanswered questions. Last week, we introduced our game show. I roll right here. What are the top 10 spices in the world? And we had a little conversation about salt. Is salt a spice? Is salt a herb? Is salt a mineral? What's going on? We've talked about spices and herbs before, but I thought it would be a good time to introduce even another category to the art of cooking, the science of cooking, the plant and minerals of cooking. Mm -hmm. We can agree that salt is one of the most essential ingredients in cooking, right? Sure. Yeah. Salt and pepper go together, right? You buy them in two packs often. Mm -hmm. Well, if pepper is a spice, wouldn't salt be a spice too? Clearly, I know that salt's not a spice, but I would think it would be considered a spice in one of those like top 10 A spice are any dried parts of a plant that aren't the leaves. Okay. That's the category of spices. Okay. Herbs, the leaves. Right. So salt not being a plant means it can't be either. It is a mineral. So in the AIP diet, I'm not eating spices. I'm eating herbs. But you can't have cinnamon. I guess. Oh, okay. And so that's, that's ground dry. That's bark. The bark. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The stuff I can't have is specific to seeds. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what other minerals are used in cooking the way salt is a mineral. So mm-hmm. let's gong that. Mm-hmm. So four or five weeks 
into the AIP talks. Which means it sounds like it's about time for me to schedule LaDonna to come on and talk to us sounds about great. her experience as a naturopath. What has been for you, for real, the largest challenges in changing your lifestyle to do it? Finding enough food to eat. Because the food that I'm eating is really low calorie. And I'm eating more. Mm -hmm. I don't intermittent fast anymore. I eat in the morning. I eat all day. Kind of grazing all day? Yeah. I mean, when I'm, bu when I'm really busy in the garden... I might go, but I always come in and get myself a smoothie, mm -hmm. you know, around 10 or 11. And then I might not eat lunch until two, but if I'm inside around noontime, I make myself some kind of lunch, chicken salad or some kind of soup or something like that. Did you like feel that. the same and way then, on Whole30 when we're eliminating for 30 days, bread, dairy, yes. butter, same feelings? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I felt, there's a I lot felt of, hungry. Yeah, a lot of calories go away when you take bread, for example, off the table. Well, I had already taken bread off a long time ago, but now I've taken eggs off. Now I've taken potatoes off. Now I've taken popcorn off, other grains, rice and things like that that I chocolate. ate. Chocolate. Yeah, chocolate, mm -hmm. different kinds of drinks that added more calories and stuff like that. So I think that that's probably the, the making sure I have enough food is probably the most challenging part of it. But I would say the most exciting part of it is a sense of healing and a sense of empowerment. I feel bad about a lot of the packaging because there's a lot of more packaging with some of the like dried fruits and things like that that I'm getting from the store. Mm -hmm. If we were doing more of that on our own, if we had stores where there was a lot more like dried fruits and things like yeah. that in bulk, then I wouldn't have to do quite so much packaging. I'm not exactly losing weight, but I'm definitely eating more food and I'm not gaining weight. As far as like the travel part of it, you know, yeah, I mean, there's definitely the challenges and anxieties of having to go into restaurants, feeling sad about going, not really having the full experience of some of the really amazing restaurants that mm -hmm. we got to go to or could have gone to. Probably. Or, or just diminishing the experience that we would have had otherwise. Yeah. But even that is so cultural, you know, the idea it's like. I got stopped in the grocery store the other day by a woman who has been listening to me talk about my AIP stuff and the homesteading stuff that we do. And we, I was talking to her daughter because she was explaining to me that her daughter is having to um, do this. And she's a mom. I would guess she's either a gen, an older Gen Z or a very, very young millennial because she's got, you know, a child that's probably like 10, something mm -hmm. like that. And having her talk about the experience of the Valentine's Day party at the school, you know, oh, God. and the culture and the conditioning of mm -hmm. this is how we party. This is how we celebrate. Right. You know, yeah, well, it was the Valentine's Day party today. And the daughter was like, but mom brought Siete brand cookies for me. And I only had one swipe of the chocolate hummus, you know, and I just, I'm like, God, I hate that, you know, and I, what I love about it is the idea that these young folks are learning, okay, we can teach them how to have a party and have fun without the alcohol and the junk food and that every holiday has snacks and sugar and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But then the idea that they're being excluded, they're feeling left out, and when I would bring these types of things up as a mom at the schools, I was always like the Karen mom. You know, back before Karen mom was real, I was like the original Karen mom. Just go so with like, the flow, Aislinn. Yeah. Like, n I couldn't Everyone get gets four king-sized Snickers today, and that's just the way we roll. And I was the mom that I, I wanted to let my kids be included in parties and things like that. But mm -hmm. I was like, I wanted to be a homeroom mom. Mom. That's what I wanted from the day Cortland was, when I knew I was having Cortland and he was coming and I worked at his little school as a little, you know, teacher at the preschool. And then it was time to go into kindergarten. I wanted to be a homeroom mom. I wanted to plan the party and I wanted, but once it got to that time, I was like, there's no way they would not let me do that. I would not be the one that no one would want me to be the homeroom mom because I wouldn't do it. I could never volunteer at any of the things because I wouldn't bring the list of 
junk food uh, there would be like oh fruit tray as like the bottom of the list it would be like bring 12 uh, bags of chips mm -hmm. and 20 things of cookies and bring one fruit tray and right. i would be like okay i guess i'll bring the one fruit tray you know and then it, they ask you to sign up to participate in like the concession stands like they need the eighth grade parents we're raising money for the eighth grade trip and you they know? want you to make money take money while you ladle the rico's nacho literally cheese literally poisoning our athletes I couldn't do it and then I had to be the mom that was just the mom that didn't want to volunteer or the mom that didn't want to participate the mom that was excluded over there and I was thinking about that mom and I was thinking about that kiddo and that side of this is the thing that I think about I'm going to go to Kushan that amazing New Orleans yeah, restaurant but yeah. I'm not going to be able to do it the way that Joe gets to do it but here's what I think is beautiful and here's what I think is empowering me and here's what ex is exciting me about maybe even seeing if there's a way that I can control contribute in this community in this way. I know that we're going to move forward. I'm going to go through this hardcore elimination phase, and then we're going to move into bringing things back and creating the perfect recipes that don't make me sick or anyone else around me sick and that are going to be really good tasting foods. So this is what I feel about these 10 year olds, right? When I look down at this little girl and I talk to her and I say, listen, you know what? You keep doing what you're doing. And I'm so proud. I looked at her mom and I'm like, I'm so proud of your generation for continuing to be the mom that shows up with the Siete brand cookies and trying to do things differently. Because someday I truly have hope and believe that there's going to be parties where that kind of crap is completely different. Oh, I we feel like we're teetering on the edge of a revolution. Yes. And more and more people that we're talking to even friends of mine that don't adopt any of this stuff mm -hmm. are like, I feel like shit. I, I go to the movies and I look at the selection of snack. We went to the movies. Yeah. And we try to look around, to like find anything, uh, anything like, in, in, like some fruit, a banana. We right. can buy a banana from you, you know, like I believe that there are at the movie theaters, for example, in larger cities that have those options. Well, there's gluten-free options at Alamo draft house, for example, on the menu. Now we've gone a step further than gluten-free, but I think the other saving grace here for you is the amount of people that have reached out to us specifically mm -hmm. yep. since we have started talking about this topic. Yep. So just like the rabbits, we're all learning together here. Yeah. And the food actually is delicious. Yeah. Like same woman where she's talking about her birthday is coming up. Right. And she's like, and I say, we've gone and we just went to New Orleans and so I broke, I didn't have the full elimination while we were in New Orleans because I was on a trip and I had no idea. And, and I was going to eat crawfish. Period, right? I was eating crawfish, right? But when we got home, my parents hadn't had a really good crawfish bowl again. And all of our crawfish talk got them horny for crawfish. Exactly. So my brother is all excited about having crawfish. He wants to go get crawfish. So they make a plan to get crawfish. And I'm like, oh man. And then I go, or I don't even know. I think my mom might have said, hey, I wonder if Joe would just like boil you up some. I was like, yeah, we could just salt them, you know, whatever. And I'm like, you know what? Hold on. I can eat citrus. I can put garlic, onion, garlic and onion. Those are all things that we would put in a normal boil pot. We could put plenty of salt. Mm -hmm. That's what we'd put in a normal boil pot. I've had cilantro, a base. Um, it was in a like more of a Vietnamese uh, style of crawfish where they put a lot of cilantro in the flavoring of yeah. it. So I suggested we put my cilantro salt and add some fresh cilantro into it. You made me a boil of crawfish. Oh, I was glad to do it. Yeah. And so that's a great example of here. I'm talking to this woman and she's trying to sort it out. She's got her daughter. There. They're trying to sort my birthday. She says, my birthday's coming. We always do a crawfish boil. And I'm like, hey, I've got this other idea for you. And what that makes me think of is this thing that it's like, we can find ways to yeah. make stuff work where you can still have these beautiful celebratory and really delicious foods. And I'm serious, delicious foods that are just as good that don't have a lot of the crap in it. And here's the other thing that we have to remember about the autoimmune issues and the leaky gut and all of that. That is an unhealed body. Okay. A body can handle natural spices, natural plants, fruits, all of those types of things, if it is healed and certain bodies are going to react differently to these particular things. So you're going to get to have these great experiences. We're just going to have to be more aware of, let's not pick on the people 
or let's not seclude the people or let's not make every celebration about food. And if you don't eat this kind of food, then you don't get to participate in the celebration. Well, you, did you feel shortchanged in our crawfish celebration? Absolutely not. Okay, and so I also didn't feel shortchanged at Super Bowl party. Well, let's talk about those two things first. Yeah. Your dad picked up a 30 pound bag of crawfish. We're used to that. And rather than throwing all of it into the typical crawfish mixture that we love so much, mm -hmm. but is filled with pepper, cayenne and other, mm -hmm. that you're not doing right now, that's all I really eliminated. And then added to, as a flavor enhancer, the citrus you talked about, and I went liberal with it. Fresh lemons and fresh oranges squeezed directly into the pot. Mm -hmm. A huge thing of garlic. Plenty of onion. Plenty of your cilantro salt. And then I took a big clump of cilantro. Yeah, because I have lots of cilantro. Tied it up with right a rubber now. band and threw that in there as well. Filled it full of water and we boiled our crawfish that way. I was concerned about everything that you're talking about. While you're surrounded with family eating the good old-fashioned crawfish that you tend to love, mm -hmm. that you were going to feel shortchanged. I'm so happy that you weren't. Yeah. Was it really a huge deal for you to do that stuff separate? Was it like hard? Like a different pot, no, you know, whatever. Not at all. Yeah. I say this over and over again about talking about this. I do understand that there is a convenience, education, and money concern for the initial phases that we're about to go through with this shift in dietary concerns and needs. But I think the best thing we can do is that those of us that have the ability, like you and I, like with the podcast and with just the things that we play with because we're foodies, we've had a concern and a care about food. That's what we've been we talking about for cooking. over three years here. Exactly. So we're kind of ahead of the curve on that. And this gives us the opportunity to share with people, look, you can still have these amazing fun celebrations. We're just going to change them up a little bit. You know, I even think about the crawfish boil, like paying attention to the ingredients and knowing things about your ingredients. When you pick up a crawfish mix, crawfish boil, crawfish seasoning or whatever, look at the seasoning. And if it's got a bunch of MSG and other types of synthetic yeah. processed things that you shouldn't be eating anyways, this is a time to not mess around with that stuff anymore. You've got to get that stuff out of your diet, especially if you're starting to find some of these issues. Just start with that alone. You don't have to take out all the natural foods. Just start taking out only the things that find a mix that doesn't have all that crap in it. Or just make your own, which is what Joe and I talk about on a regular basis is you can make, you can look at your favorite crawfish boil bag. And you can make it exactly the same way and leave out all the things they do to make it shelf stable because you don't need it to be shelf stable because you're, you're going to use it, it that day. Leading into what I cooked you before the Super Bowl, we have to talk about the big box of baby spinach and baby kale mm -hmm. that we're buying at the grocery store. Yep. Those pre-washed boxes, mm -hmm. we've had at least seven of them. Mm -hmm. You're using them in smoothies. Yep. And I'm cooking that mixture as a base of greens often. And you know what? I don't know why I wasn't. We weren't already doing that more before. It's so easy to I tell do you what, garlic, I, onion, and spinach. This mix. I perfected my so ability delicious. to do greens. It's my favorite green. It's so good. Low heat. Your diced onions. Mm -hmm. When you got about thirty seconds left on those, I put the garlic in so I don't burn it. All of this in avocado oil mm -hmm. or olive oil, E V O O. I turn the heat up and put in the spinach and kale. I get it exactly the way that I want it turn it off and serve it to you. I've also made a lot of steaks. It's yep. nice just to have sliced cold steak in the refrigerator. Yep. That's the lunch type grab food I can do. And of course, I'm not putting any pepper on the, when I'm, you know, mm -hmm. pre-marinating it in spice. Onion powder, garlic powder, both acceptable, very much our friends. The only place where I would be sadly missing black pepper is things that I don't eat anyway right now, and that is tomatoes. Because I always felt like I needed right. ketchup and tomatoes. I needed a Bunch ton of black, pepper. of black pepper. Now, I'm not eating tomatoes, so I'm not feeling like I'm missing anything with black pepper. So since I had some steak in the refrigerator, and I'm cooking those steaks medium rare, so in case I have to reheat them, there's a little room to go forward. Mm -hmm. I just diced it up, put it into a healthy portion of that uh, spinach and kale that I just described. And then here's my other tip for you, cocoa aminos, mm -hmm. coconut aminos. Like a spinach beef stir fry, basically. It's like a soy sauce. Mm -hmm. It's a little sweeter, but it's an AIP staple. Yeah. I splash that onto that dish as well to give it kind of a oriental soy saucy taste. And you gobbled it up. 
Yeah, I totally, I mean, like a huge bowl. I've just ate like a huge bowl of food. But the interesting thing was that you had kind of planned, because that was the day that we had gone to pick up the rabbits yeah. and you wanted to get home to watch, watch the Super Bowl. I, I don't give a crap about the Super Bowl, but I was well, on team, whatever you want to do, let's get back home so that we can watch the Super Bowl. However, you had kind of planned to do the hot dogs yeah. that we get from Turkey Hollow because you were like, oh, they don't have nitrates no or nitrites, nitrites in it. Yeah. The thing about it is, is that when they make their sausages, they're making them with their flavoring and their seasoning in them. And there's black some powder and chili powder. There's some stuff in there. So I've noticed that with some of their other, um, you know, meat flavorings and stuff like that. And of course it makes sense. You want your sausage to have the salt, the peppers and all of those types of things. I would love to learn how to maybe make some of our own sausage where we could do it without, but it'll be interesting to see in the elimination phase, whether black pepper is one of the things that continues to be an issue for me. And once but you start reintroducing of, foods. Exactly. Yeah. But because that was all of a sudden just thrown out as the Super Bowl food that we were going to try to nosh on throwing together this thing really quick so easy if it, i've got the greens available uh -huh. i've always have onion i've always have garlic and there's going to be some kind of meat if i didn't use steak that day i could have probably used chicken or pork we're keeping a lot of cooked meat yeah. in the fridge for you to snack on and as I you think, graze all day long yeah and i think that that's an extremely important part as people are asking me questions because everybody's looking for the convenience of it this was an, an easy quick way to do something in quick response to we need food she needs something to eat. Yeah. When I've I'm got making the steak already meat, cooked. And when I'm making meat, I'm making more than I need to for the leftover thing now. That's just the, the way I'm doing it. You mentioned your sweet potato patch. When you're not getting attacked by snakes, <laughs> you're collecting a tuber that you can eat as much as you want of. Mm -hmm. So we've been making a lot of baked sweet potatoes, cubed sweet potatoes in a sweet potato and beef stew that I made that I thought was fantastic. I took the leftovers of that on the trip with us. Mm -hmm. And the day that we would have hiked, but it got rained out, I made that for us to kind of calorie load. I added some scrambled eggs to mine. You skipped the scrambled eggs. Yep. But it is so good. It's simply a stew with sweet potatoes instead of your potatoes, but you do have your carrots. You got your broth, cilantro, parsley, green onions, and uh, throw a little avocado on top with, of course, the stew meat. It, that was incredible. And you're also using a seasoning that we ordered off of Thrive that is specific to, um, it's, 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 it's primal. A, yeah, it's an AIP Mrs. Dash, basically. Mm -hmm. It's got dried herbs that you can use. No so pepper. It's basically that you can. something that I should be making on my own because it's got dried Look herbs and salt, told, yeah, totally. and I can make it on my own. Now, I want to add. About the sweet potatoes, the baked sweet potatoes. And people are thinking like, oh, how do you make a baked sweet potato delicious when you can't use butter and you can't use Greek yogurt or sour cream or whatever you like to use? So what I've been doing, my oil, which your butter is your oil, my oil, I'm using either an avocado oil or an olive oil. And then I'm using the coconut-based unsweetened yogurt. Yeah. That I get H-E-B's generic brand. This That's the best one. AIP staple. Yes. Along with your baby kale and baby spinach, along with your coconut aminos, mm -hmm. you've got to get coconut yogurt with no sugar. And it's important to look at that because I noticed that at natural grocers, they carry an unsweetened version. It's that silk sweet or so sweet. I don't mm -hmm. know, whatever that brand is. It's got sugar in it. It's No, it doesn't have sugar in it. It has rice starch in it. Ah. So you can actually use tapioca starch because tapioca is, is with cassava. It's the same family or it's the same tuber or whatever. But you can't use rice starch. So you have to pay attention to these types of things. Oh, you're reading labels. Oh my God. I mean, today, I was so sad because I buy these big six pack containers from natural grocers of my watermelon juice, mm -hmm. right? And I grabbed my watermelon <laughs> juice out of the fridge and I um, threw it in the cart and I got it home. And then today I was so excited. I went in there to grab my watermelon juice and I pull it out and I go, crap, this is not the one I normally drink. This has cayenne in it. So you, this is a thing. You cannot just whip through the grocery store and just grab things because one moment they change the point of sales and you grab something off the wrong shelf. And so paying attention to your labels, you guys, this is like the real deal. I brought up the sweet potatoes because you also had a baked sweet potato with the Super Bowl. Yeah. And then your mom who loves... I was stuffed loves, at the Super Bowl, by the way. <laughs> your mom who loves to get involved, and she is such a blessing for doing so, said, I'm going to whip up some AIP paleo spinach dip. Mm -hmm. And she did. And you loved it. Yeah, and I really did. you have ordered another batch of it yes. from me. Yes. It was really good. Okay, so she heated up. I think she said that she added a little bit more of the broth in it because she thought it needed a little bit more of the flavor. Yeah, I'll just quickly it. list the ingredients. Avocado oil, garlic, onion... 
full fat coconut milk. So she used cream coconut cream. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Which was great. Mm-hmm. Coconut milk, coconut cream. These are now on your AIP everyday shopping list. Yeah. Nutritional yeast, salt, broth. We'll post all these recipes on our Facebook page. So the night of the Super Bowl, it was kind of hot and she had sliced up some cucumbers yeah. for me to dip in it. And of course, after I'd eaten this ginormous bowl of all this other food that you had made and then the sweet potato or whatever, I was just kind of nibbling at it and watching Rihanna, which was really good though. I enjoyed it. But then the next day, as I'm getting my lunch going, midday stuff, I mean, the chicken salad recipe that you make for me. Talked about that a few weeks ago where instead of mayonnaise, you use avocado and avocado oil. That's what makes it kind of creamy. Right. I will tell you that I thought it was too avocado avocado-y this last time. Okay. So less than the avocado, more chicken, and that recipe is getting close. You put in apples this time. I did. So you said you wanted a little different. crunch. I liked the celery crunch a little bit better than the apple crunch. We'll get to growing so more celery. Here we you are. can have all the celery you <laughs> here want. Here we are playing with the recipes. Well, oh, right? I love that we're in the playing with the recipes phase. Mm-hmm. Now we're perfecting them. Yeah. Finding the good foundational recipes and perfecting them. This is a fun journey. It is. But what I found was the next couple of days, I was eating this dip cold. And not only was I eating cucumbers, but I was actually eating carrots yeah. dipped in it. And probably the list, long-time listeners know, I am not a fan of raw carrots. Raw carrots I'm just are not, not your one of those people that loves raw carrots. I'm actually not a fan of beets and raw beets. I don't mind a pickled beet, but I don't care about beets. Well, this diet is making me eat. It's As a matter of fact, my naturopath, LaDonna, she actually said, you personally, Aislinn, with the way your body is acting, you need to eat more beets, you need to eat more carrots, you need to eat more root vegetables. I'm like, okay. So here I am using these carrots to dip this sauce up. Right. And I'm really feeling so much better about things that I felt so like, oh, I have to be on a diet, you know, like before in the old days. Now I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad to be having some dip, some just delicious salty dip. And I have my carrots and mm, these carrots are so good. And Now the next time we make this spinach dip, I want to add artichoke to it. Okay. Yeah. And instead of coconut cream, I'll use the coconut milk that's in the recipe just to see if it's different. Gotcha. Which one do we prefer? I think the nutritional yeast is really important too. I think recipes that are calling for nutritional yeast, you mentioned a few episodes back about you wanted to try to make, can I, what can we use as cheese, What can, quesadilla, you yeah. know, whatever. I actually bet that there's a way to make a quesadilla some kind of thing where you do it using something that you make with nutritional yeast. And the reason I think that is because as I'm starting to look at some options, you know, you can buy a Kosova pizza dough, right? And then you make a pesto or a base, like a white sauce base, which I like white sauce pesto pizza anyways. Mm -hmm. And you use nutritional yeast, which gives you some of that like cheesy, salty flavor. It's probably going to be a coconut cream and nutritional yeast. That's going to be as close to a cheesy, melty that you can get. Let's gong this. Let's do it because I just said the other night, I miss pizza. That's like, there are certain things in life and pizza is one of them that I always go, oh, I miss popcorn at the movies. I miss pizza. Now, we can't solve the popcorn of the movies problem, but we might be able to solve the pizza problem. Well, you did sneak in some pork rinds. Oh, I eat pork rinds. That's my snack. Yeah. <laughs> That's and my, your like, seaweed chip snack. strips. Oh, I love, I'm addicted to those seaweed things. And I just bought three green plantains. I'm going to, for yes, next I'm week, so we'll talk about, about plantain chips that I make. I also saw so many interesting recipes about little crackers and like waffles and cookies yeah. and all kinds of things where you use plantains and tapioca flour and cassava flour. We're and moving things like there. That. We're moving there. Yay. Now, the other thing that you missed was a creamy comfort something. Joe, I need a creamy cut. Co- These steaks are beautiful. These steaks are amazing and comfort food. Plenty of pork, but I want something creamy. Can we do a pasta? You had found some AIP approved pastas mm-hmm. at the natural grocery. Jovial. Can you, a creamy, something creamy. Give me something creamy, Joe, please. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Spaghetti carbonara. Yeah. With a twist, it says. Mushrooms, leeks, garlic, bacon. You can do bacon. Coconut cream. Scoop out the solid part up top only. Don't use the, the liquid down underneath. Garlic powder, sea salt, and parsley. This made a carbonara that I wouldn't have known was dairy free. I wouldn't I wouldn't have known it. Toss that in with the pasta, the bacon on top. I thought it was fantastic. 
Now, one of the things I want to add in as we're talking about it, all of this is never forget that you're looking for the grass-fed grain feed meats. So your bacon, if you buy like turkey or chicken or anything that like that off the shelf, check the ingredients. The reason I buy those types of things or we're buying them from our local farmers and stuff like that is because this is the way they're feeding their animals. But in addition to that, make sure that if you're buying bacon, that you're buying bacon that doesn't have any nitrates or nitrites in it. Correct. That's an important part of this as well, because it's not just about eating bacon. It's about eating this really clean bacon. And it's not just about eating vegetables. It's about eating organic vegetables because believe it or not, these particular parts of the conversation and the types of synthetic things that are coming out of the soils, even if it's soil that hasn't been grown on by an agricultural farmer for you know, 50 years, it's still got stuff in the soil that is making us sick and is adding to some of these gut barrier issues. Good point. There hasn't been a large shift for us in either of those categories. Except for vegetables. There are certain vegetables at the grocery store that are unavailable organic or I just didn't pay attention. I'm talking about once upon a time, but now I'm paying more attention to try to bring only organic vegetables into our life from the grocery store. The stuff you grow, we're not worried about, of course. Yep. During this elimination phase. And it also want, makes us fast forward and want to fast forward even more so to growing all of our own animals for our own consumption here because we absolutely know 100% what our animals are eating. What are our chickens eating? What are our rabbits eating? You know, all of those types of things. We need to be more careful about what it is we're feeding our animals because they are what they eat and we are what we eat. That is the truth. In the interest of variety, I have bought shrimp more times in the last four weeks than I have the last four years because you wanted a shrimp pasta kind of thing. So yeah. the AIP approved pasta, this was a simple one, oil, garlic, some of that spinach and kale. I told you lots of spinach, you guys, lots Lemon of garlic juice, and onion. <laughs> salt and parsley. Mm -hmm. A real simple it was really good citrusy too. saucy that we flipped in with pasta. When I do my shrimp, I do two minutes on a side and then let it rest while it continues to kind of cook all the way through and then toss it in there as well. And that was just a delicious, easy one. And you can find all different types of pasta. We go to our natural grocers, but I'm sure that there's some of it available at our HEB and then across the country at different grocery stores. You know, orzo, elbow pasta, fusilli, uh, penne, spaghetti. There's all different types of pasta that you can use. And they're decent pastas. You've heard me complain about, you know, oh, gluten-free pastas are never the same. Well, it's better than nothing. Let's there are gluten-free <laughs> pastas that are better than other gluten-free yes, pastas. Yes, true. Yeah. Like the time that I boiled gluten-free pasta, when I went to pour it through the <laughs> colander, it was just a soup. Of course, that was made with chickpea, which is a legume, which I can't eat anyways. So that didn't work. stick with the cassava. The cassava stuff works really well. Okay, longtime listeners are going to know that one of our favorite things is a vegetable fried rice. Mm -hmm. We love a vegetable mm -hmm. fried rice. Mm -hmm. And while I'm at it, I'll probably do as close as I can to a Benihana style, hibachi style yes. steak or shrimp or both. So we got to celebrate Valentine's Day, you guys. That's we right. I took you out to the. Oh, no. You posted a few days before <laughs> Valentine's Day, that's right, Joe, you could take me to my favorite local nursery, Turner's Nursery, and buy me some quote unquote flowers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then we could make a delicious meal at home. And then when someone asked me, what are you doing for Valentine's Day? I don't know, whatever she wrote in that post. <laughs> So we did exactly that, and I was going to... Well, because I think to... sometimes you get into that whole, like, well, first of all, does she want to celebrate Valentine's Day? And for me, it's not always, it's not necessarily Valentine's Day. It just so happens that Valentine's Day falls on an anniversary for us, which yes. is, we talked about, you know, our big first crawfish boil and all of that kind yep. of stuff. So, we were Facebook official on February 14th. So, yeah. So Valentine's years Day ago. happens oh, to be a special day for us, in addition to the fact that it's this big like whatever consumer holiday but i've already gone through the holiday season and the gifts and the celebration and the snacks and then we've already talked about this i do not want to celebrate like that anymore but that doesn't mean that i don't want to celebrate and so how do we do it well of course let's go to the nursery it's february the 14th which is traditionally for our region the turning point, maybe the last frost day. I don't consider it the last frost day anymore. I consider it a little closer to the end of February, the last frost day. But it helps you remember that now's the time to start getting your tomato plants and all of that stuff. So I'm like, let's start making it a tradition to where what we do is we go to the nursery and we spend some time together and we buy flowers, real flowers, live flowers. And then we come home and make a 
delicious meal and hibachi is what I would have, that's something I would have asked for anyways on a special date night. We've talked about cauliflower rice before, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again. We have a food processor, the kind with either the spinning blade or the spinning discs that will grate food. If you run ahead of cauliflower through your grater, you've got what you can use to make cauliflower rice. So first things first, cook my steak, cook my shrimp, set it aside. And then with my big wok, I'm cooking all of those vegetables. Starting, of course, with your onion. You also used some of my really pretty pink celery. I did. And some turnips and some purple carrots and some beautiful stuff orange out of the garden. carrots and mushrooms and i mean all the vegetables i could think of that would go into a delicious vegetable fried rice mm-hmm. then when the timing is right you add that cauliflower in and you're using the coconut amino instead of soy sauce mm-hmm. and of course there's no butter like i like to do with my vegetable fried and rice there's no Plenty egg of butter. And there's which is no one egg. of my favorite things about fried rice but i've cut up my shrimp i've cut up my steak that's when i put it in when i mm-hmm. put in the cauliflower rice and now i'm just tossing 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 until it gets to the heat that i want taste 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 this is all fantastic then when we were in New Orleans, I think the last night we were in New Orleans, we dropped into a sushi restaurant. Yeah, we were in the French Quarter and it was closing time of a sushi restaurant, like right there on Frenchman Street. Yeah. And they had a soup on the menu and I kind of risked it. Nori soup. I asked them, do they put soy sauce in the nori soup? What do they use as the base for it? And it's a fish broth, basically. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm going for the nori soup. And so I said, that is really good. I would like you to make nori soup in the future. So we're pulling together a hibachi night now. He's making, you know how they get the grilled shrimp and they like throw it at you, you know, like he was throwing grilled shrimp at me, you guys. And uh, so he's got a seaweed soup flying in the background or something like that, right? a lot of imagination here. More it was like the la 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 smorgasbord (laughs) chef going on in the back. The nori that I got was the seaweed sheets that you would get to make sushi with. That's kind of fun. I went over to the Asian market to find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To find good ones. I didn't want to get the ones that just get distributed all over the country at every single grocery store. I wanted to find authentic ones. Yeah, and we've talked about going over the Asian food market and just getting a better understanding of what they have over there. So you, I told you that's when I, you grabbed some of those green plantains for us too. Mm-hmm. An eight ounce can of sliced water chestnuts. I'm not a huge fan of water chestnuts. Seriously, they're okay. They absorb the flavor of it, but... Like, less of those would have been nice. And this recipe called for a pound of ground pork. We've got ground pork. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a flavor base. Then Mm -hmm. you put your water and your broth into the cooked pork and let that simmer for about 15 minutes. Then you throw in your water chestnuts. I won't use those next time if you're not a big fan. Yeah, I I don't love them. And there was a lot of them in there. So it's kind of like... You know. And then a splash of the coconut amino. It was mm-hmm. not in the recipe, but I just decided to do that to kind of give it an Asian tang. Mm-hmm. And then your sheets, you were in there with me. Mm-hmm. Is this as much seaweed as you want in it? Because as mm-hmm. soon as it hits that water, it, it goes just... from a sheet form into the, it looks like a piece of seaweed. Yeah. And that's really the flavor that you're getting, the nori that you're getting into the soup that I think you really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Throw some green onions in there and you started tasting it. Now I'm, now I'm leaving out an egg. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving out sesame oil. Right. Tofu. If you wanted to put tofu in there, a lot of places do that. Yeah. I thought it was really good. Yeah, it was really good. You said it was an easy thing to make. It really was. So that's another thing that I would say would be on the list of convenience, quick things that you can make. And, and it got me into... It gives you that salty treat of feeling comfortable. Yeah, it got me into the Asian market and I always like that. Exactly. Now, you mentioned smoothies up top. Yes. And I think you should go into a little detail. Definitely hit the carob smoothies because when you make those, I come running. Yeah, the carob smoothies have become a dessert thing. We did them several of the nights on the trip to New Orleans because, you know, we're not running out to have some kind of sweet treat. We're talking about having great celebrations and not feeling left out of things. Well... Some kind of a slushy, sweet, delicious smoothie of the taste like cocoa at the end of the night does hit the spot. It does. And so what I found was I can use carob, which has a similar flavor to cocoa. And then I do a banana. You could throw in just a date, like any medjool date would work. 
but I've been purchasing these little dates with coconut in them that you can buy in bulk or you can buy them at your, you know, natural grocers or whichever store you go to. Those are a really nice little nibble too if you have, need a sure. quick nibble of something good. sweet at the end of the night. I don't even night. like coconut and I like those now. Yeah. You have to throw one of those in there because it adds a little bit of the sweetness to it that you're going to need to really feel like you're having your dessert satisfaction. I also go ahead and throw in a handful of the spinach because anytime you can get some more greens into your diet, that's a good thing. You want to put some of the... You're not putting so much in there that I'm noticing any kind of spinach no, no, no. flavor. No, it's not about that. It's just like, about it's adding like a, a little vitamin bit more. Yeah, exactly. Pill. Got it. And I'm also taking every opportunity to throw in all my powders again. So I'm throwing in my um, collagen powder every time I make a smoothie. I'm throwing in moringa powder every single time I make a smoothie. Moringa is a super green that grows on a tree. We actually can grow the trees here in our area. You can find it at any health food store now. It's a super green powder, basically, called Moringa. I throw that in there. Unsweetened coconut yogurt. Mm -hmm. Put a little bit of that in there. I use coconut water as... Because when you're making a smoothie with all this thick stuff in it, and then you're going to throw some frozen stuff into it in order... It's going to get so thick, it's not going to turn really nicely. And you want it to... Dilute I it. want it to be able to pour into my glass. I don't even want to have to deal with a straw. You like a straw because of your beard. Yes. But I just want to be able to drink a nice, cold, chocolatey flavored smoothie. So I'm using coconut water, just basic coconut water in it for that to give it that Check the juiciness. back of your coconut waters. I had to for do that. Sugar. All sugar yes. added. Yes. Found one that didn't have Yep. It. Yep. Check the labels, you guys, over and over again. Just keep doing that. And then, of course, I'm using a bag of frozen berries. You could use frozen strawberries. So if you think about it, it's chocolate, strawberry, banana. Chocolate, berry, banana yeah. is what we're making here. I noticed kind the of... flavor difference comes from the frozen fruit that you choose to use. Yes. So... I would prefer to use all strawberries, but we've only had, which, oh, man, when you went to the store today, I should have told you I needed some more frozen fruits. I ask and I buy. I know. I try really hard to think of all the things, but Just that's... text me anytime. Yeah. So, yeah, you can, and you can buy like a mixture of fruit. Frozen berries, you can buy frozen mangoes, frozen pineapples. Make sure you're buying all organic. Yeah. And then you can kind of decide which pieces. If you want peaches, I'm not a big fan of peaches, but you can do peaches. fine with me. I'm not a fan of peaches either. I don't know why. They're just kind of like, most peaches are so Although I really love your peaches and and I want to shake your tree. It's a very nice tree. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm I'm a good tree. You know, I'm very rooted well. And I grow well and I swing and sway and, you know, I'm just kind of fantastic like that. So one of the things I want to say is, is that when I make my smoothies in the morning, I'm throwing in carrots, I'm throwing in beets, I'm throwing, I mean, I'm making a morning smoothie. This is smoothie. not your carob It's not the same thing. Right. I don't put ice in the morning. I just use frozen fruit because I want it to be no extra water. No, I just want it to be this heavy duty meal when I go to drink it. At night, I want that thing to be a dessert of icy goodness. So I actually put real ice in it and blend it up really nicely. So it's this really cold, delicious banana berry, coconut, chocolate, flavory dessert type thing. So we had that as our little dessert Valentine treat. I want one of those tonight. You want one tonight? Please. I'll see if I have enough stuff. You have I'm just saying stuff. because my frozen berries. Get I'm it done. Rah, rah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the first few weeks with a week's vacation in there. Mm-hmm. It's a starting point to help you get started. I hope you did a good job for you pulling out the essential grocery store items yeah. that you're going to need to use. Yeah. Tonight, I'm doing the first no tomato. Yes, I'm excited about this. Spaghetti sauce. Yes. There's yes. no tomatoes, no nightshades in this sauce. Uh-huh. And I, we'll go into more details yeah. on that next week. Yes. I'm excited about this. The plantain chips. Yeah. That'll be new next week. So we're about, I would say we're about 10 to 15 days into a full-fledged elimination at this point. And mm-hmm. I've got to really make it to 90 days before I begin reintroducing some of this stuff. Yeah. So you're going to get to hear a lot more about it. Also, I would say always reach out to me. I am scheduling coaching appointments yeah. as we speak. I'm literally scheduling gardening coaching appointments and wellness and specific to diet and grocery stores and all of that kind of stuff. You can do that in person. We can actually meet up in person and have a meet or we can do it over Zoom. If you don't live in my area or it's a bit challenging for us together, we can actually do that by Zoom very easily. Lovely. All you have to do is reach out to me, DM me, and let's talk about it. And let's talk about what your needs are and let me help you with 
besides the AIP stuff and the wellness diet and lifestyle and all of that stuff, there's a lot of things. And I know we're going to talk about more in this in the next couple of weeks, but there's a lot of stuff coming out in the news right now. A lot of scary stuff about wellness, um, about our food, about access to food, about the cost of food, about these chemical explosions that are going to be causing issues in communities and wellness and all this stuff. And I think that we're going to need to talk a lot more about homesteading. I think we're going to need to talk a lot more about helping people get their gardens going and Mm -hmm. how do they get started with rabbits and chickens and all those kinds of things. So if these are things that you're interested in, these are the types of consultations and coaching appointments that I am scheduling currently have been doing for several years. I will also be continuing to do more of those live videos. I'm going to do a live video in the grocery store very soon where I actually pull things off the shelf and show you ingredients and take some time to talk about that. But I'm very easy to get a hold of on all of the social media things. We together as a couple are very happy to answer questions the best way we can. If we don't answer it or we don't answer it immediately, it's because A, we didn't have the answer or B, we might have just missed it. Try us again. Or C, we're waiting for next week's podcast to answer your question. We do that a lot too. In the lives, I'm definitely doing that. I'm answering a lot of my questions live. Let's bring this episode home with our random question of the week. Well, this is a really interesting question Okay. because one of the things I talked to my therapist about, and by the way, we, I want to hear more after we get off the podcast about how your therapy appointment went today. Okay. I had a conversation with my therapist today about a challenging night that we had where oh, yes. we were, you know, dealing with. And, and the main question I had for her was like, how do I deal with it in the moment? How do I deal with me? How do I change me? How do I get me to be better at handling these situations? How do I keep myself from going to the depths of shame, guilt, fear, sadness, da, 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 da. How do I do this thing? And so I think this question is really interesting because there's a lot more people trying to figure this stuff out. How do you make yourself feel better when you're sad? Well, speaking of therapy appointments, (laughs) I'm an emotionless monolithic robot. <laughs> so you're just a cancer into, crab that protects himself from his sensitivities. That's another way to put it. <laughs> getting into the idea that I have emotions is step one. Yeah. And then when I start feeling sad someday, I make you feel sad sometimes. I'm, on I'm purpose, being, sometimes I I'm being sarcastic. Yeah. You told me you got sad when we had a hard night. You told me the next day that you were sad about how that went down. How did you... The last night the... of our vacation, we gotten into an argument. Yeah. Stupid, habitual bullshit that That's we pull. Right. And I really didn't want to get into an argument with you on this vacation. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be another feather in your hat. I know. You're like, I wanted to get to another vacation where we didn't do the thing that we do. We did a better version of it. I will say that. I don't know. No, we did. We accomplished it better the next day. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm not sure I did better. <laughs> After driving in silence for a period of time. We were listening to a really good book called Radical Wholeness, which I think anybody that's into what we're into should listen to it. I think we both dropped our egos Mm -hmm. and had a real conversation. Yep. Not only about the thing that we were arguing about, which is always stupid, Mm -hmm. but the way that we argue. Yeah. And this acknowledgement that we don't want to argue this way any longer. The next day. And the next day, I was really upset. You were sad. About yeah. failing. Mm. Okay, so what do you? how do you fix that? How do you feel better when you're sad? I consume media. Mm-hmm. I distract. Yeah, you distract. I don't know if that's a bad answer, though. Well, it, I think that in some ways it's a path of least resistance. And then let's see, you know, what can we do to deal with it? To me, that's how I'm looking at it. Like, how can I deal with it better? Right. I don't want to distract from it anymore. I want to understand what it's about. I talked to you about it. I said, Mm -hmm. I'm really upset that we Mm -hmm. got into that argument. Mm -hmm. I'm really upset that both of us individually have the power to stop it. And we both have the power. When we exercise the power. To take 100% responsibility. And if we were working in tandem, we could stop it like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt. We do. But it's that that. we're decided in that moment that we're not going to work in tandem, that we're in the argument to begin with. Yeah. So then you've got to turn off the feelings. See, I don't think you you turn off the feelings. 
that's what I talked about with my therapist. I think recognizing the feelings that I'm having and, and then allowing you myself think that to I observe. ever turn off the feelings. No, I think you have, I think what you, you don't want to turn off the feelings. I think that awareness in the middle of it. Yes. Oh, awareness of, of the feelings. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's some kind no, of... No, I'm not saying you want to turn off... I'm saying you never want to turn off your feelings. You want to be aware of your feelings. And then instead of reacting to your feelings, take an observation of your feelings. And then... Because once you begin to understand... Okay, so you're saying the, the feelings. Hold on. Shift the feelings? No, no. Because then you're trying to control the feelings. This is exactly what we talked about in my therapy session. Then you're trying... See, and that's how I do it. That's the problem that I have is that I try to control the feelings. And so I'm like, okay, there's that feeling. I can feel it. Okay. Now I'm going to tell him, no, we're not going to argue. I don't want to argue. And then I don't even let you have your feelings because, and then you don't like that I'm not letting you have your feelings because I shut everything down when feelings start to happen, right? Okay, and, so what, okay, there's two questions the now on the table. What, how do you lean This is going to have to carry over to next week. Mm. <laughs> Let me tell you about what I do when I'm sad. I was doing the codependent thing up until a recent point, which was I was just trying to talk to you or trying to like connect with you. When I feel sad, I just want to be with you. I just want to, you know, figure out how to be with you. I want the fight to stop if you're the reason that's causing me to be sad. And that just creates more fight oftentimes, right? Or if someone else makes me sad, I just want to be with you. Like you are the solution to my sadness. Well, you can't be the solution to my sadness. Mm -hmm. I have to be the solution to my sadness. And honestly, what I'm doing right now is I'm actively stopping what I'm doing, thinking about oh yeah, that's my ego that is feeling that sense of pain. I am sending gratitude for the pain and I'm trying. And, and in the worst case that night, the night of that fight, I can't get there. Like I don't remember how to get there. But the next morning I was like, well, oh not, yeah, and I'm not I pull out my, I pull out my daily spiritual practice. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, why didn't I do this last night? It's gratitude for adversity. It's letting go and remembering that my ego does not have to control this. I do not have to be afraid of the history of it because I have no idea where this is going, where the sadness is going or where it's going to lead. And so I think that that is, it is allowing it to occur in a flow and then being grateful for it. And so in terms of like doing a thing, well, the thing that I'm doing is meditating. The thing that I'm doing is stopping for a moment and allowing myself to feel Feel it. That's what I'm doing right now. Now there are things you can do, like do a distraction. Like I can go eat some delicious food, or I can go watch a movie, or I can go do yoga, or I can go on a trip, or I can play with the you know dog. play with it. Play, playing with a dog is a very good like helpful. I know, but sadness, the question is almost but... like a cause and effect. You are sad. Mm -hmm. What do you do? We'll read the question again. How do you make yourself feel better okay. when you're sad? Okay, so you are sad. You are going to do a thing, and then you're going to feel better. Yeah. Me, I'm going to meditate. Me, I'm going to like center myself, ground mm. myself. That's what I'm doing to make myself, when I'm sad, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm and glad it, we had this talk. Yeah. The dinner table in real life, our actual dinner table means that we're running the gamut of all emotions. Yeah. The presentation of dinner table talks, we have to be honest about these things from time to time. Yeah. Do you remember in that new show that we've been watching? It's a lot of fun. Shrinking. Yeah, on an what, Apple Plus. Who is the characters in it? It's it's guys Harrison that I like. Harrison Ford and uh -huh. Jason Segel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go through. They're talking about grieving. You know, I'd, I'd actually like to try what they've done. If I, you know, when I feel that sense of grief again, right. because we went through a lot of grief at the end of twenty two. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of grieving there at the end of the year. Still am. What they did was they said, I turn on 15 minutes of really sad music and I just let myself feel the grief. And then when the 15 minutes is up, I go on to do something else. And so I think that there's an element of that that I'm feeling called to, of like feeling Rather the than grief. distracting. Grief is a part of something that I hold gratitude for, that it is just as valued. The suffering is just as valuable as the joy in the all of understanding. We're now working to getting into higher alignment, into a higher note of resonance, right? So I loved that they brought that up as a way to grieve, mm -hmm. let it out. And I do, and I do have a tendency to do that. Like if I want to cry, there's a reason I want to cry. I'm going to go listen to some really freaking sad music. I want to feel joy. I want to feel like music. 
I have a lot of anger inside of me and I feel like I need to get it out. Oh man, I'll throw on some DMX. I'll throw on some good like hardcore rap, you know. That's the kind of stuff that really helps me. But it's all me. designed to sit in whatever the emotion is that you're feeling yes. in that moment. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, this session is over. <laughs> That'll be $150. <laughs> Or just reach out to me and we'll see if we can make an appointment for you that matches what your needs are. And we'll talk about all of these same kinds of things in person or on Zoom or whatever works for you. I wanted to be a homeroom mom. Well, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Dinner Table Talks. We will be back next Monday with a fresh episode. In the meantime, hit us up on social media, send us an email, DM us, whatever. We want to hear from you. And we hope that you're enjoying the episodes as much as we enjoy creating them for you. (laughs)